thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. And thank you again, Andrew and David, to, for inviting me to this uh, uh, lecture today. I'm honored to uh, uh, be able to deliver this talk uh, at the Kirby Institute. And I thought uh, it would be appropriate to uh, uh, present uh, data suggesting that on-demand prep is also an option for uh, MSM in particular. So what I'm going to do over the next 45 minutes is to review the data we have that support uh, this uh, dosing regimen for PrEP among MSM. And I would restrict my talk to MSM today, I'm not uh, addressing the uh, dosing regimen for other high-risk population. We could discuss that after the presentation. So if we look at the current status of on-demand PrEP right now, it has been recommended as an alternative to daily PrEP for MSM in France initially, then the UK. The European guidelines, EACS, also recommended uh, uh, on-demand PrEP for MSM since 2015. And Quebec recently also uh, um, recommended uh, for MSM both daily and on-demand PrEP. And more recently at uh, IES in 2017, uh, the WHO statement on on-demand PrEP was the following. Uh, even driven PrEP has shown to be highly effective and acceptable among men who have sex with men in high income setting. Um, also, uh, warning that this uh, dosing regimen has not been uh, tested among women and heterosexual men yet. So, uh, what are the potential benefits of on demand PrEP? Um, I think it could be for some individuals more convenient than daily regimen and may uh, lead to uh, improved adherence and therefore overall effectiveness. Potentially, there is also a better safety profile due to uh, lower drug exposure, especially related to kidney and bone toxicity, and it could improve uh, that way cost effectiveness. But there are also two other potential benefits of fundamental threat that are not uh, immediately thought the first one is that it would allow an easier diagnosis of breakthrough HIV infection. And, and today, that's an emerging issue among people using PrEP, uh, how to diagnose HIV infection when you have very low, if uh, not undetectable, viral load um, uh, uh, PrEP users with HIV breakthrough infection. And potentially, there is also, with undone PrEP, a lower risk of selecting drug resistance. And you know that among PrEP users, usually uh, induce drug resistance when you saw PrEP in someone with primary HIV infection that has been missed by the uh, even uh, the best uh, ELISA test, which are not 100% effective to diagnose primary HIV infection. So if you start daily PrEP in those individuals, you would uh, select for uh, drug resistance, whether, uh, whereas if you use on-demand PrEP and not uh, daily PrEP, the, the likelihood of selecting resistance is probably lower. So this is uh, how uh, on-demand PrEP is being uh, used. So you start PrEP uh, before a, a sexual intercourse, and you continue uh, actually PrEP after a sexual intercourse. So it's not only pre-exposure prophylaxis, it's really pre- and post-exposure uh, prophylaxis. And this is uh, different from another non-daily uh, PrEP regimen, which is called time-driven PrEP, where people are instructed to take uh, pills at uh, defined times during the week, usually twice a week, for example, in that uh, cartoon. So what do we need to know about on-demand prep regimens to make sure that these are effective regimen? It would be important to know the timing of HIV infection following sexual exposure, to uh, know data from animal models, uh, to have uh, good data on the PK of drugs, both in blood and tissue, and to make sure we achieve the right drug concentration at the right time. We uh, obviously need to have efficacy and safety data in, in trials. And I think it's also important to know what people prefer in terms of dosing regimen. Do they prefer daily or on-demand regimen when they are asked uh, that? So in terms of timing of HIV infection, the data are suggesting that it takes two to three hours following exposure to infect the first um, CD4 T cells in the rectal tissue. So uh, it's uh, critical to have uh, drugs probably uh, 
at the right transformation very soon after uh, uh, sexual exposure. Also, uh, it's thought that the persistence of HIV in the genital tribe following uh, uh, sexual exposure is two to three days. So that means that you still need to have drugs on board for two to three days after uh, sexual exposure. The problem is that the drug concentration that is needed to prevent infection, uh, either at the entry site, in tissues, or in blood, is yet unknown. And we have to speculate you know, what would be the, the right drug concentration. And we don't even know if these drug concentrations should be achieved in blood or in tissue. If you look at data from animal models, I guess the, the best data come from the, the CDC group uh, had by uh, Wild Dynami. And uh, they have looked uh, in their model at daily prep. And you see daily prep here in red. And at the different uh, um, types of uh, uh, on-demand prep or intermittent prep, and they have looked at different uh, um, regimens. And in red here, uh, they looked at uh, a dosing regimen where they would uh, give the animals uh, uh, TDFFTC two hours before the uh, rectal challenge and uh, 22 hours after the rectal challenge. And if you uh, look at the graph, you would see that with this type of challenge, you get some level of protection, maybe not as good as daily uh, prep, daily is in red, but that is not uh, in this model uh, uh, significantly different as compared to what we, with the dash line uh, animals who were not receiving uh, prep. In the same study, they also looked at, uh, at the double dose of uh, TDF-FTC in these animals before and after uh, rectal challenges, two hours before, 24 hours after. And using this double dose, they increase actually the efficacy of their regimen. And um, the efficacy they have found was actually even better than with daily prep uh, with the limits of the, their model. And, and actually, if you can see uh, the, the two uh, uh, inside graph, the only animal who became infected had actually, for unknown reasons, low uh, uh, drug levels of both TDF and FTC. And so in their model with uh, this double dose of TDF and FTC given two hours before and 24 hours after rectal challenge, they have shown an efficacy of uh, 83%. Let's look at the data now that we have in humans uh, on the PK of TDF-FTC in blood and rectal tissue. In this uh, uh, study using single dose of TDF-FTC and uh, looking at uh, the PK of uh, TDF on this graph in blood in, in red and in genital tissue, rectal tissue, vaginal tissue in pink and blue, you could see that following a single dose of TDF-FTC and looking at only tenofovir in blood, you can detect tenofovir for up to two weeks after a single dose. So the, the drug has a very long half-life, as you, as you may know. And we're not talking here of tenofovir intracellular uh, diphosphate level, but just uh, uh, tenofovir in, in uh, plasma. What's interesting here is when you look at rectal tissue, you see an even higher exposure in the range of 30-fold higher than in blood. And you can see that after 14 days with a single dose of TDF, you are able to detect high levels of uh, tenofovir in rectal tissue, much higher than in blood as well. We've done in the hypergate study uh, a similar experiment to look at uh, the level of tenofovir and FTC in rectal uh, biopsies. And we wanted to look at uh, these levels, not at 24 hours, but during the first uh, hours and uh, after uh, exposure. And following a single double dose of TDF-FTC, we looked at uh, 12 individuals in whom we um, perform rectal biopsies at uh, half an hour, one hour, two hours, four, eight, and 24 hours after the single dose to look at the concentration of tenofovir and, and FTC in rectal biopsies. And we were surprised to see that tenofovir was detected as soon as half an hour after uh, drug intake, whereas for tenofovir, it uh, took 24 hours to detect the drug in rectal tissue, and you have uh, you know, HIV-infected individuals receiving uh, TDF-FTC as controls, and you can see that the level of drugs uh, was actually quite similar. These data have been uh, obtained also uh, in macaques with 
similar uh, profile showing that FTC was uh, more quickly detectable in rectal tissues than tenofovir, suggesting that tenofovir uh, might be um, effective a little bit later than FTC to protect infection. In that same study, we also looked at uh, the infectability of explant rectal biopsies by HIV ex vivo, and you know, uh, with the limits of uh, the sample size, we we're able to see that as soon as half an hour, you could reduce the infectability of these uh, rectal biopsies by HIV. Also, when you looked at the tenofovir diphosphate level in PBMC at 24 hours following a single dose, and you, you may remember that in the IPG dosing regimen, we give four pills for one sexual intercourse. Uh, with a single dose of two pills at 24 hours, half of uh, the individuals, the median uh, level was uh, uh, 16 fentanyl per 10 to the 6 PBMCs. And I will come back to this level of 16 fentanyl. Another study uh, done also with a single dose of tenofovir in healthy uh, women looked at the uh, decay of tenofovir in plasma and the, uh, on the bottom graph you, you look at the uh, tenofovir diphosphate level in blood and you know the authors said that the tenofovir diphosphate peak was at 12 hours but when you look at the data you can see that you know uh, it's difficult to see a, a real peak in these uh, uh, individuals and you know the, the level is quite uh, high as soon as uh, a couple of hours after uh, uh, in uh, absorption. Uh, uh, also, also in, in, in these studies, they have shown, shown that the exposure of rectal uh, tenofovir, but also tenofovir diphosphate in rectal tissue was much higher than in blood, and, and also in, in the vagina. So, so to try to address, address the issue of you know, what type of drug concentration you should reach in PDMC in order to get protection from PrEP. Um, this study looked at two different uh, data sets. The one from IPRAX, uh, looking at a case control study, um, patients who uh, in IPRAX received an free FTC and who remained uninfected uh, in black, and those who uh, got infection in red uh, despite the use of PrEP. Uh, and in, in that case control study, uh, the median concentration in those who receive uh, the FTC and who remain uh, free of infection was 16 fentanyl per uh, 10 to the 6 PMCs. In the case, those who uh, got infected despite the use of uh, a PrEP, um, actually the vast majority, 93%, had no drug detectable. And therefore, if you do regression analysis uh, using the IPRAX data, you can see, and you can say that uh, as long as your tenofovir uh, diphosphate level was above 16 fentanyl per 10 to the 6 cells, you have a 90% reduction of um, HIV acquisition, risk of HIV acquisition. If you look now at the data from another study, the STRAND trial in HIV and infected volunteers, these individuals received uh, tenofovir FTC either every day, seven uh, times per week, or four times per week, or two uh, times per week. And if you look at uh, these uh, 20 individuals for a group, uh, at their um, median tenofovir diphosphate level in PDMC, you can see that um, the level increased with increasing dose, and uh, the predicted risk reduction of HIV acquisition was uh, with two pills, 76%, with four pills per week, 96%, and with seven pills per week, 99%, as compared to the data from IPRAX. So it's a little bit of a stretch to, to compare these two studies, but that's the data we have to suggest today that an FOB diphosphate level above 16 fentanyl would be a level that is associated with a 99% reduction of the risk of HIV acquisition, and that with four pills per week, the risk reduction is 96 percent. All the studies have looked at uh, that uh, level of uh, 10 to the 6 uh, of the 16 fentanyl to try to assess what's the best timing uh, to start and stop uh, PrEP with TDF-FTC. And in that study, people received a daily TDF-FTC for 30 days, and then they stopped uh, TDF-FTC. 
and what the authors were uh, able to do uh, assessing uh, the onset of action of TDF-FTC was to say that uh, it took five days, five daily dose, to reach the level of um, uh, TDF-FTC, uh, of TDF uh, diphosphate level in blood that was associated with the 99 risk reduction. But uh, if you use three doses, and uh, three doses is the number of doses that we use, for example, in the, in the aggregate regimen, uh, with three doses, uh, you got a, a risk reduction in the range of 96%, that's as shown here. And when you stop, actually, uh, PrEP, um, the uh, efficacy of PrEP uh, with TDF-FTC uh, gives you uh, greater than 96, 90% risk reduction uh, for the seven days following the discontinuation of PrEP. And probably the, one of the best uh, uh, PK model uh, of uh, you know, uh, assessing a non-daily regimen is the, the study that uh, Angelica Schubert's group published uh, in the GID uh, two years ago um, when they uh, looked at uh, a PKPD simulation of PrEP efficacy in rectal and vaginal tissue, and I'm only showing here data on rectal tissue, using the hypergate dosing regimen in their model. And um, they looked not only at uh, tenophagy and FTC um, intracellular levels, but also at the level of competing endogenous nucleotides. And they used a, a model of CD4 T cell lines to identify the 90% effective concentration ratio of TDF uh, diphosphate uh, to DATP um, uh, concentrations. And so you can see on the top uh, graph that uh, if you give uh, uh, the double dose of TDF FTC 24 hours before exposure, you uh, got 98% uh, protection at the time of uh, sexual intercourse. And uh, this uh, dosing regimen allows you to keep that level of protection for the next 240 hours, so 10 days. And if you give, uh, on the bottom graph, um, the uh, <coughs> double dose just two hours uh, before sexual exposure. At the time of sexual intercourse, then you have a 91% reduction of risk, and uh, this uh, reduction is 100% four hours later, and again for the next 10 days. So these data kind of <coughs> support, again, the dosing regimen we used in, in the IPOGA study, and they obviously did this analysis following the, the clinical data that we uh, have uh, provided. So let's look now at the clinical uh, trial. You are probably familiar with the study design. Uh, the study was double blind uh, versus placebo, and we, we did that to provide the strongest uh, scientific evidence that this regimen was uh, effective. So we wanted to do that using the best uh, uh, type of design. So double blind, randomized against placebo. In HIV negative MSM, who uh, acknowledge at least two uh, kilometers of sex uh, uh, relationship with two different partners in the prior six months. And they were randomized uh, to receive either tdf on demand or placebo until uh, the results uh, were disclosed and uh, the efficacy was shown and, uh, in November of 2014. And uh, afterwards, everyone was uh, uh, allowed to uh, use on demand tdf for the next uh, two years in an open label design. So you are also probably familiar with the um, dosing regimen in the IPOD study. So two tablets, two to 24 hours before sex. This was based on the uh, data from MACAC models. One tablet 24 hours after the first blood intake and a fourth tablet 48 hours after the first intake. And the reason why we did that and, and not using double dose before double dose after, like in the macaque models, was to make sure that uh, after sex people would use at least one pill. Because in the macaque model, it was critical to have drugs given not only before sex, but also after the rectal challenge. So we thought splitting the post-exposure dose in two pills, 24 hours apart, would make sure that the individuals would use at least one pill after sex. And so overall, 
it, it takes four peels of TDF-FTC taken over three days to cover one sexual intercourse. But indeed, on demand means that if you have more sex, you uh, adapt uh, the dosing regimen. And uh, we uh, uh, instructed people who had uh, multiple <coughs> sexual intercourse on multiple consecutive days to continue to take a pill a day until the last sexual intercourse. And after the last sexual intercourse, they take the two post-exposure pills. So I think that's the main uh, also benefit of on-demand prep is that it gives you a real um, guidance on how to start prep and how to start prep. Because with daily regimen, we really don't know when we are relying on uh, PK data, which are not always uh, very uh, informative. So if we uh, look at the baseline characteristic of the patients who have been enrolled in the IPK study, you can see that the, the median age was uh, 35 years. They were at risk of HIV acquisition, as uh, shown by the high rate of uh, uh, bacterial STI diagnosed at baseline, 23 to 29% at an STI baseline when they were screened uh, to uh, be enrolled in the study. Their median number of sexual acts in the prior four weeks was 10, and they had a, a median of uh, eight different partners in the prior two months before uh, enrollment. You've seen this graph before. Uh, it was, uh, for us, a, a surprise to see the high rate of HIV infection in the placebo arm with an incident that was very high, 6.6 .6 per 100 person years. And this uh, high incidence was even higher in Paris uh, a hotspot of HIV transmission in France, where the incidence was above 9%. And as you can see in the placebo arm, in, in red, these, uh, the first patients have been infected very early in the study, uh, as soon as a few weeks after randomization. In the uh, blue arm with TDF-FTC, you see no infection during the first 60 months, and, and the only, only two individuals who will become infected actually have to continue the use of PrEP because they were tired of taking pills, developed no info sure whether these pills were effective. And so overall, in the intent to treat analysis, the um, uh, relative reduction of HIV incidence was 86%, but uh, if you look at the on-treatment analysis, it was 100%. Looking now at adherence, um, the pill count that was done during the study, you can see in the two arms, TDF, FTC, and placebo that you know, people uh, really use PrEP on the band and they change uh, their dosing regimen uh, really from uh, visit to visit. Overall, uh, they took a million of 15 pills per month, so half of what they would have uh, used uh, with the daily regimen. So they took an average less than four pills per week. And indeed, uh, when we presented these data uh, uh, initially in, in 2015 uh, to ensure that you know, these data would be acceptable from a French group of investigators, although we also had a colleague from Canada, but from French speaking Canada, so it's not like Canada. Um, so we wanted to make sure that these data would be accepted, although this was a massive control study that was not good enough. So, you know, we um, um, also, uh, make sure that for our American colleagues, we um, emphasize the, this issue of four pills per week. And uh, indeed, uh, in the IPREX or Open Level Extension Study, they have shown that, or they have reported that, uh, among uh, patients who had in their dry blood spot, tenophobia diphosphate level, which were estimated to be associated with uh, a dosing of at least four pills per week, uh, they have not seen any infection. So these data were consistent with our data. And that was important to make sure that you know, our data would be accepted again. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the last, yes, I can do that. In those who took two to three pills per week, uh, the HIV incidence was uh, 0.6 per 100 person years in the IPREX OLE study. And you can see that those who uh, took uh, more than uh, four pills per week only represented 27% uh, of the whole follow-up in hyperisolase. So it was not a lot of individuals. But still, 
the, the two uh, data sets were consistent, consistent with each other, so that was good for us to uh, make the case with the on-demand prep. Uh, at this uh, year IES conference, we uh, went a little bit further to show uh, in a sub-analysis of the aggregate data in individuals who took less than 15 pills, so less than the median during the study, that we took these skills systematically or often at least during sexual intercourse. And we looked at the uh, incidence of HIV in the placebo and the TDFFTC group. And uh, in this analysis, we showed that, again, there was uh, protection uh, against HIV uh, with uh, uh, no uh, infection in those uh, CME TDFFTC and six infection in those uh, in the placebo arm with a pretty high incidence in those with uh, uh, low use of PLs uh, in the placebo arm. And what was interesting in this analysis was to show that these individuals had a median number of sexual intercourse of only five as compared to ten in the whole study, and that these individuals were protected against HIV with a median use of 9.5 pills per month which would present less than 2.5 pills per week. So um, uh, suggesting that um, the, the reason why in IBA the dosing regimen of under prep was effective was not only because it was four pills per week on average, but because it was under prep and even individuals using less than four pills per week was also, were also protected. We looked also at uh, drug levels uh, in plasma in both the blind study and the overall level study. And what's shown in this graph is that you know, overall uh, the same proportion of patients had detectable TDF um, in their plasma. And uh, the level of below 40 nanogram per ml tells you that these individuals have taken PrEP in the last 48 hours. And so these are uh, interesting data to try to understand how people uh, use PrEP in the study. Uh, more recently, we published the uh, results of the open level extension of the IPD study. Uh, since after the results of the double blind study, everyone was um, um, asked to continue uh, the follow up with uh, open label on the TDFFTC. So 99% uh, of the individuals actually accepted to continue the study, and it was actually the uh, only way to have access to PrEP at that time. And with uh, more follow up, because everyone uh, received a uh, underlying TDFFTC, you can see that the incidence of uh, HIV in that uh, open level extension was only 0.19 per 100 person years of follow up, so much lower than in the uh, TDFFTC arm of the double blind study. And indeed, only one individual uh, became infected, and that individual actually discontinued the use of PrEP because uh, he thought his partner was not infected but it was wrong, his partner was infected, he stopped PrEP and got infection. So in this uh, open label uh, phase, what's interesting is when you compare the data and the incidence in the uh, TDFFTC arm to the placebo arm of the uh, double blind phase, you got a 97% reduction of HIV incidence. So again, uh, a strong uh, evidence of efficacy with the Sunderman regimen. What about safety? I'm going to go fast on these slides. Uh, during the uh, double blind phase, there was no uh, uh, real events that would lead to a uh, drug discontinuation. During the open level extension, three individuals discontinued uh, on demand prep because of low creatine clearance. In two of them, it remained within uh, the normal range. Uh, in terms of ALT elevations, the uh, grade three and four elevations were due to uh, attributed HCV infections in those individuals. Uh, so no uh, major safety issues in that study. I could come back to that if you want uh, uh, after the presentation. So in summary, the IPO data uh, showed us that the incidence of HIV infection among gay men in France was very high, especially in Paris. That on the demand prep was highly effective in these individuals. Um, it didn't show the data, but uh, there was a low use of condoms, less than 20% uh, of the individuals uh, reported use of condoms, but it did not undermine efficacy, as you know. The safety was very good, and indeed, uh, PrEP improved satisfaction and removed the fear of getting HIV infection during uh, sexual activity. 
And so, so these results, with other, led to crop approval in France by the Ministry of Health at the end of 2015. So even before the publication, uh, which occurred in December of 2015, and as soon as uh, uh, January of 2016, PrEP was approved and reimbursed in France. And so today, uh, PrEP is approved uh, for people, uh, for adults at high risk of uh, sexual acquisition of HIV. It can be prescribed by hospital specialists uh, in STI clinics and by GPs. A GP can only renew prescription, they cannot initiate prescription. TDF can be uh, delivered in pharmacies and also in private, uh, in hospital and private pharmacies in, in uh, every city in France. Um, the Ministry of Health launched a national awareness campaign for uh, men who have sex with men to let them know about new tools for prevention and uh, testing as well. And now, as uh, was said, we have a, a new study to assess the impact of upscaling PrEP in France on the HIV epidemic. So that's how the uh, National Prevention Campaign uh, looked like. These posters were displayed in all major cities throughout France with a link to a, a website, sexosafe.fr, where you could get information about testing, uh, treatment, prevention, vaccinations, etc. So. Uh, it's uh, um, interesting uh, resources for gay men to have a lot of information about uh, PrEP and uh, on this website they uh, have information about daily PrEP and on-demand PrEP. We reported at IES the, the first year of experience of uh, PrEP in France uh, with nearly 3,000 people uh, starting PrEP, mostly MSM. Uh, as you say, 23% uh, use chemsex, 36% at an STI, 11% use uh, uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. <coughs> What's interesting was that 57% started PrEP on demand in this uh, real-life experience. And in terms of seroconversion, uh, only four seroconversion were seen uh, in individuals who, uh, for two of them, were infected at baseline, and two others actually did not uh, took their regimen with an overall incidence which was very similar to the one we've seen in the open opening session of the hypergate study. Uh, we presented also at IES in a poster our experience in uh, the San Luis Hospital with PrEP. Um, we started a little bit before uh, the approval because we thought we had enough uh, evidence to, to start the PrEP training before approval in November of 2015. And also because of the pressure we had to, to start uh, uh, delivering PrEP. And we've seen uh, between uh, November of 2015 and May of 2017, uh, more than 1,000 people now we have more than uh, 1,500 people on PrEP in, in our clinic. What's interesting was that uh, at the first visit, we uh, diagnosed HIV infection in 10 individuals at nearly 1%. So that, I think that also shows uh, you know, the benefit of PrEP to target the hidden epidemic of HIV infection in high-risk individuals. Very few had no indication for PrEP, so we started PrEP in more than 1,000 people, and uh, probably because we were one side of the IPG study, 75% of the individuals started PrEP on demand. And after uh, uh, roughly uh, uh, 500 person years of follow-up, uh, in that study, we've seen only three HIV acquisitions, uh, two uh, among people uh, using uh, daily PrEP, one uh, in individual on, on demand PrEP. In all three individuals, there was a consistent use of PrEP and almost no use of PrEP at the time of HIV acquisition. So I think these are also reinforced uh, evidence of the efficacy of on demand PrEP among gay men. Uh, you may know that the European guidelines, which have been updated uh, last October, uh, also recommend PrEP for HIV negative MSM and transgender individuals, where condoms are not used consistently. And if you look at the bottom uh, of the slides, you can see that both daily and on demand PrEP are uh, allowed for MSM at this point. There is a uh, learning course on PrEP uh, that is uh, provided by EAS. It's free, so if you're interested, uh, it could be uh, uh, informative for you to see how in Europe we are dealing with um, information about PrEP because that's an issue that we have now 
to find uh, enough physicians aware of how to use PrEP to uh, provide PrEP for, for people at risk. What is the use of fundamental PrEP now uh, outside France? In the UK today, 10 to 20% of NSM are using on-demand PrEP. In Belgium, the last uh, um, survey shows that uh, up to 50% of NSM are using uh, on-demand PrEP. In the Netherlands, is one-third of uh, NSM in their demonstration project. In Canada, they have two cohorts. One uh, in the SHUM, uh, where actually uh, was a site of the aggregate study, 57% of their uh, NSM on uh, PrEP used on demand. At the uh, Clinique Actuelle, they were not part of the aggregate study. They still use uh, on demand PrEP in 22% of their NSM population on PrEP. And when you look at the uh, data uh, from the uh, Actuelle Clinic in Montreal, and when they compare those uh, using on-demand or daily PrEP, those using on-demand PrEP were a little bit older, three years older, um, and uh, they have uh, fewer uh, occasional partners than those using daily PrEP. These were the only differences uh, in, uh, between the two uh, groups. So uh, if I have time, uh, I could go quickly through the older data we have with intermittent PrEP studies uh, to cover uh, this issue of non-daily PrEP regimen. And if we look at these data from Kenya, this is an, a pretty old study, uh, not uh, looking at efficacy, but looking at adherence in, in MSM and uh, female sex workers in, uh, in Kenya. They look at uh, uh, two different regimen, daily or uh, time-based uh, TDFATC, uh, two PLs per week and one PL two hours after sex. Versus placebo, and um, when they looked at the uh, adherence rate, uh, they thought that uh, uh, adherence with daily regimen was in the range of 80 to 90 percent, whereas with intermittent uh, prep, adherence was lower, especially when they looked at the uh, postcoital dose uh, with um, text messages and, and med caps, where uh, they were able to to document the use of post-exposure pills. Uh, only in a third, or less than a third of individuals. And here I'd like to make an important point between these uh, post-exposure PL and the uh, dosing regimen we have in the um, uh study. In that study, as well as the ADAPT study, the post-exposure PL was requested to be taken by individuals two hours after sex, whereas in our study it was 24 hours after sex. And I think it makes a big difference for people uh, to take the post-exposure PL 24 hours rather than two hours. Because uh, when we designed our study, we thought two hours after sex, it is too short. People uh, cannot think about taking a PL just two hours after sex. And so I think that explains why, uh, although it's also post-exposure uh, PL, uh, adherence is quite different. Actually, there was another IAVI study uh, you have two in Sardiscom couple in Uganda, and uh, in that uh, study, actually, uh, adherence to PrEP was much higher with the uh, event-driven PrEP, 45% uh, uh, for the post dose and 91% uh, for the uh, twice-weekly uh, dose. And so uh, when people were asked about what regimen they would prefer, daily or intermittent, there was actually a higher proportion of people um, uh, preferring uh, the uh, intermittent dosing uh, despite the challenges with the post dose. The safety was, was actually similar uh, in that study. If we look now at the data from ADAPT, the uh, HPTN 067 uh, trial, part of these studies, uh, these that have been reported uh, recently in the last said HIV among uh, high-risk women, and I will concentrate here on MSM, uh, in two sites, in Bangkok and in uh, Cape Town. No, not uh, Cape Town, sorry, in New York, in Harlem. And so in that study, which was not bound to look at efficacy, people were randomized to receive after um, a leading period where they received one pill per week of directly observed therapy for six weeks. They were randomized to receive daily Truvada or uh, time-driven Truvada twice a week with a post-exposure dose within two hours after sex, or even driven through VALA one tablet prior to 
uh, sexual intercourse and a second post-exposure dose, but again, within two hours after sex. And then they looked at the coverage of sex event, which was the primary endpoint. Coverage means one pill taken at least in the four days before sex and one pill taken in uh, the 24 hours following sex. And when you look at the data from uh, Bangkok, uh, you can see that uh, daily is in blue, uh, even driven in red, and on-demand or sex-based is uh, in green. You can see that overall complete coverage uh, seems better or is better with uh, daily, but not that different with uh, uh, on-demand. And, and the difference lies here in the proportion of uh, the people who would use only the pre-sex dose, um, uh, suggesting that uh, the issue with this event-driven uh, regimen was uh, the issue of the post-sex dose. Uh, and, and I think that you know, asking people to take, again, this post-exposure pill two hours after sex is probably uh, uh, too demanding for individuals. So overall, these data looked uh, rather pretty good with the uh, event-driven regimen. In Holland, the data are less uh, uh, good, I would say. And uh, overall, even with daily prep, you can see that only 66% of the individual had uh, a sexual event covered even with, with daily, and it was a little bit less with uh, time-driven or event-driven. If we look now in Bangkok at the number of pills needed to cover uh, sexual intercourse, you have in blue uh, what was required and in red what was taken by the individuals here with daily, uh, in the middle with even driven, and uh, in the right hand side with uh, on, uh, even driven or underman prep, if you wish. And you can see that the number of pills needed is much less as expected with on demand uh, prep. Another aspect of that e uh, study was to look at enophobidine phosphate level in PBMCs and um, to uh, assess the proportion of patients achieving detectable concentration with the three uh, dosing regimen at week 10 and at week 30 in those we had sex in the past seven days. And you can see that whether you look at daily, uh, time-driven or even-driven, you, know, you find the same proportion of individuals having detectable uh, TNFVA diphosphate concentration in PBMCs. If we look at uh, the number of patients who seroconverted during that study, uh, and I focused here uh, uh, on the, the, the three arms in uh, the free sites, so including women, you could see that six individuals actually uh, became infected during the, the directly observed therapy, therapy phase, phase, so before randomization. Uh, uh, interestingly, three in Cape Town in women. women. Then post normalization two uh, became infected in the daily prep arm, one, one woman in Cape Town, one man in, in New York, two in the time driven uh, prep arm, again, two in the two women in Cape Town, and uh, with the even driven prep, again, two women in Cape Town. So, although this is not uh, power to look at efficacy across the different arms, it tells you that among MSM, in uh, uh, New York and Bangkok, Bangkok there, there was, was no infection in the non-daily arms, uh, whereas there was only one with the daily arm uh, in New York. So, so I guess this is not uh, obviously evidence of the efficacy of, of uh, not daily uh, prep in that study, but at least these data would not contradict the fact that on demand prep <coughs> is effective uh, in, uh, in our study uh, at least. And, and if you look, look at the summary from the investigators um, of the ADAPT study, um, they will tell that uh, adherence was suboptimal with um, uh, non-daily arms uh, in uh, MSM, and especially in women. But I would say in Bangkok, actually, the, the adherence was uh, quite similar to, to daily uh, PrEP. Uh, there was comparable PrEP coverage. The, the issue with the regimen was, as they highlight, the, the lack uh, uh, of uh, post-sex dosing, but I think this is, or could be due in part to uh, the dosing regimen two hours after sex. Um, as I've shown you, um, the uh, level of drug detection in PDMC was high, 
in all three arms. And um, they acknowledged that, uh, you know, in their final uh, conclusion that these results indicate the feasibility of non deadly regimen in some MSM operation. And I would agree with that. So let's finish by uh, asking uh, him and what do they think about intermittent uh, PrEP? Uh, there was a, a survey done uh, in France uh, uh, three years ago asking uh, nearly a thousand gay men uh, what uh, they would prefer daily or on demand. The, the majority would prefer on demand. Um, and also those interested in PrEP in general were uh, those having unprotected anal sex. There was another survey uh, done in, in the U.S. on a thousand significant gay men also. Some uh, said they were interested by intermittent prep, uh, whether those having less than uh, three uh, days of sex per week in particular. There was another survey that I'd like to, to show you uh, among, again, uh, nearly a thousand of young MSM recruited by Facebook in 2015 in the U.S. And they were asked about the different modalities of PrEP, gels, pills, in injections. And um, as you can see here, uh, their favorite uh, PrEP modality was on-demand PrEP uh, uh, before uh, daily PrEP. And they were also asked uh, about the PrEP modalities they would prefer according to uh, the type of sexual uh, uh, intercourse that they would have. And whether you look at uh, insertive and receptive uh, intercourse, receptive only, insertive only, or no anal sex, every time on the prep was ranked first. So I will conclude it here. Um, I hope I have convinced you that we have now compelling evidence uh, on the effectiveness and safety of on demand oral prep with TDFFTC among MSM. On-demand oral PrEP gives, I think, uh, good information and uh, good guidance on how to start and how to stop PrEP, which I think is critical for people uh, using PrEP. And uh, I think now the next step would be to assess on-demand oral PrEP in other population uh, with potentially uh, also other drug regimen to see whether these dosing regimen can be extended to other high-risk population. And with that, I'd like to, to thank all the people who helped me to uh, do these studies and the, the support from the founders, the NRS, uh, the CTN in Canada, the Gates Foundation, the CX from France, and Gilead who provided drugs and the CEO for these studies. Thank you for your attention.